Man, I am excited about today. First service was awesome. We had five people give their lives to the Lord in just that service alone. So how many of you believe that God wants to move in the lives of his people? Absolutely, he does. So here's what I want to do. I want to, first of all, tell you it is October 24th that we're doing truck or treat. That is for the kids. And here's the thing. How many of you are big kids and love candy? All right, so you, it's okay for adults to eat some of their kids' candy. How many can, can amen to that? So what does that mean? Don't bring no cheap candy. Don't get that yucky stuff. Bring the good stuff. Amen? So bring that good candy. But I, I'm excited because today we're ending our series that we've been in the last three weeks. And it's been one that was birthed out of a tough season for me. Because I don't know about you, but there have been times where as Christians, we, we feel like we can't question God. Kind of like if we did, there was going to be some proverbial lightning bolt that just came down and, pff, and we're in ashes. And so you just don't question God. But what I have learned in my years of being a believer and believe, being a Christian is that there are so many times throughout Scripture where the people of God questioned Him and survived. And I believe that God is big enough to handle the questions and the complaints and all that we're going through because we have those things that go on in our lives. So I call this series When God Doesn't Seem Fair. When God doesn't seem fair, when you look all around you and it seems like, God, why aren't you doing something? Because you're God. I know you can. I know you could if you wanted to. I don't understand why you won't. So God, help me wrap my mind around it. And if that is your place in life, how many of you would say you've ever felt like God wasn't fair? Let me see your hands. Come on, it's okay. So many hands, but we've been afraid to voice that out loud. And when things don't make sense, a lot of times as Christians, we make up stuff. You know, I don't know why God did it this way, but he's this and he's that. And I don't know why God did it that way because we want to make sure we don't make God look bad. God's too look good to, and too good to us to look bad. So we can ask our questions, and when God doesn't seem fair, that's when we have to push even, even harder into our relationship with the Lord. So with that said, have you ever faced a difficult situation where you knew that God could do something and he didn't? Well, if that's your story, then that's what this message is going to be about for you today. We're looking in the book of Habakkuk. Most people like Habakkuk what? You know, not Tobacco, Habakkuk. All right, it's in there. It's one of the 12 minor prophets. There was 12 of them. Of the 12 minor prophets, we know the least about Habakkuk. His life is kind of a mystery. But to give you a little backup of who he was, it was written about 600 years B.C. before Jesus. He was one of, again, the 12 minor prophets. And the prophets, what they did is they brought the people of God a message from God. But Habakkuk was the only one that went back to God with a message from the people. Like, what's up, God? We don't understand. Explain yourself. We don't, we don't get it. So Habakkuk, he's sitting here, and God comes to him and basically says, Habakkuk, the people of God are just so wicked. I'm, I'm so tired of how my people are living. So I'm going to come down, and I'm going to destroy them, and you need to tell them that I'm about to do that. Well, it kind of freaked him out. He was like, hold up, God. Why would you do that? I mean, I know your people are bad. I know that they're a little off-center. I know that they've done some terrible things, but do you really have to destroy them? But that even isn't what freaked out Habakkuk the most. It's when God told him how he was going to do it. He said, I'm going to take a people that are even more wicked than you, and I'm going to use them to destroy you. And he's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's zero sense. And you're not going to like who they are. Well, who are they? And he said, I'm going to use the Babylonians. And he said, the Baba who? Uh, 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 no, 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 God. I know your people are crazy. I know they're perverse. I know they're seeking all kind of worldly stuff. But why would you use the Babylonians? They're ten times worse than we are. And you're going to come down and destroy us and use people worse than us to do it. That just doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. And God, it doesn't seem fair. And God, actually, I protest. I protest and I believe that that's not fair. So we're going to go on strike. We're going to riot. No, they didn't do that. But God, it doesn't seem fair. And if that's your story, you're going to relate to the story of Habakkuk. Now, I've used an illustration the last two weeks to describe this called The Dip. I did a series a few years ago based on a book by Seth Godin. It's not a Christian book, but it's a book that describes very many things that we as Christians go through. And he did a chart, and I'm going to use it a little bit differently than what he did. But this chart is a chart of The Dip, and it starts out here in the lower left. And I've explained it each week for those that weren't here. That's where basically we all start out in this world. We don't have a relationship with God. We're at ground zero. We come to church, we encounter someone that shares the gospel with us, we come, uh, it it piques our heart to want to know Jesus, so we start on this climb, this this pursuit of God. All of a sudden, we, we get a hold of God, and things are going our way, and we're excited about it, and then we get up to this pinnacle. Everything's going our way. Everything's coming up, sunshine and roses, and it's just like life is so grand. We're shouting it out from the rooftops. God is amazing. You should serve God. Look what he's done for me. Then the honeymoon's over. 
life kind of hit levels out. It hits the skids a little bit, and you start going through what's called the dip, and you start going down that curve. Now things aren't going your way, and you're panicking a little bit, and you're like, why is this happening? Did I do something wrong? God, did I make you mad? Did I, do it? Did I not do it right? Why is my life happening this way, God? I don't understand. And you go through that dip, and when you hit that dip, you hit that lull in life, two things usually happen. We either panic and scurry as, as fast as we can to climb and claw our way back up to that place where we were at the highest of heights because we all want to live on the mountaintop. Because we feel like maybe I did something wrong, i got to get back where I was. Or we just jump ship all together and go right back to the beginning and say, God, I'm, if that's how life's going to be, then I don't want to be it. I'm just going to go back to what life was like before God. And we jump ship. But I'm here today to tell you the last two weeks we've been looking at this. Sometimes things get worse before they get better. Sometimes you hit that that lull, you hit that dip, and you feel like that God is abandoning you. You don't know where he is. You don't understand why life's happening this way. But I'm here today to tell you that if you'll hold on and you'll go through the dip, you will get to the other side of it. Chapter 1 of Habakkuk, we looked at the first week, is kind of like where it starts to dip down. That's kind of where you start asking questions like, God, what's going on? Chapter 2 last week was when you were at the lowest of lows and you're just waiting. You're like, God, you could do something. You're not. I don't understand why you're not. Do something, God. I'm waiting. But I'm glad you came back this week because chapter 3 is getting out of the dip. We all learn more than we ever wanted to learn in the dip. That's in the lowest points in life that we learn the most about ourselves, about God, about who we are, about our friends. And it's in the dip that we learn the most, we grow the most. But I want to get out of the dip. How many of you are with me? So chapter 3 of Habakkuk is about getting out of that dip. And it shows you if you'll hang in there, if you'll hold on, you can see it in the New Testament in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. He's sitting here and James is saying, Consider it pure joy, not just a little bit of joy, pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. Does it not sound like the the brother got knocked on the head? It's kind of like, consider it pure joy. Be so excited when you go through trials and tribulations of many kind. And you're like, James, are you on something? It says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What he's saying is you'll hold on. If you'll hold on in that dip, if you won't give up, if you won't throw in the towel... You let perseverance run its course. You will learn more than you ever dreamed possible. You'll get through, and not only get through, you'll get to the other side and higher heights than you've ever reached. And if that sounds pretty good to you, hold on, because we're going to go through chapter 3. Because a lot of people want this real type faith, this intimate faith with God. They don't want to go through any struggles to get there. And what we realize is it's often God reveals himself in the dip more than any other time in our lives. Because when are you most likely to want to hear from God? I know that with me, when life hits the skids, it's kind of like, wait, 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 whoa, whoa, God, where are you? And I go start looking for God, and I'm like, God, I need you to come through. So God gets your attention in the dip. And with that in mind, let's dive into chapter 3 of Habakkuk. Verse 1, he says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. On Shigianoth. Now, I don't know what Shigianoth is. It's probably a musical term. We're not going to stay there today because it's just going to be harder and harder to pronounce the more we try to pronounce it. So you just skip right on over that, right? Verse 2. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. O Lord, renew them in our day and in our time make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk is saying, listen, God, we've gone through a tough time. We've hit the skids. We're waiting. And I remember... Your miracles. I've heard about the power that you've used to display with your children. I've heard about your glory. I remember them, God. But here's the problem. You're not doing them today, God. I remember what you did back then. I need you to be that God right now. How many of you are with me? I want to see the God of now right now. I want to see the miracles today. I read about them in the Old Testament. I read about them in the New Testament. But I don't want to read about stories of God in the past. I want to live the stories of God today. I've told you all it would take is one person to get out of their sickbed. To be healed of cancer. Of a disease. To get out of a wheelchair. That it would make that this room would be packed. Whoa, pastor, you're saying that you believe in miracles? You're darn skippy I do. I believe that we serve a God of miracles. I believe that it's like Grant saying this morning, but it's going to take the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives and in operation to see that happen. And that's what Habakkuk's saying. He goes, I've heard about your miracles. I've heard about your power. 
But I'm not seeing them today, and I want to see them today, God. I don't want to remember. I want to see them. And that's a tough spot to be in. Because I'll tell you, there's been seasons in my life where I was closer to God, and I saw God more in operation in my life than I did in other times. There were seasons where it was a struggle, where I knew God could do something, and for whatever reason, I don't know he didn't do what, at least what I thought he should do. And I've always felt like, God, if you could do it before, why won't you do it right now? And Habakkuk said, renew what you used to do in our time today. He's saying, God, do it again. Do it again, God. I know you can. Do it again. Renew it. And that renew, word renew is like a, a karate term. It's like kaya, you know, when you say that. And that's what I want God to do. I want him to come down and karate chop some stuff and, 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 and show out, right? But it means to revive, to restore. God, I need you to come back and revive in our hearts who you are. We've seen who you were. But show us who you are. I remember what you did before. I know that you can. And I'm just asking you to do it again. So today, what do you do if you're in the dip? How do you get out of the dip? Because when you see your circumstances aren't changing, how do you climb out? Well, Habakkuk gives us three things. One of the things you need to do is you need to remember what God's done in the past. That's what he said. I I remember what you did. I remember what you've done. I want to remember your faithfulness. I I want to remember your character and your goodness. I'm going to remember what you've done in the past because that gives me hope for what you can do right now. And he's looking for some very visible triggers, some things that will spark some memories of what God's done in the past. How many of you know that there are certain things that can happen in life that will trigger a memory? Like even a smell can trigger a memory. When I smell my wife's perfume, it triggers memories, good memories. And I'm like, whew, I love that smell. I love the smell of my wife's perfume. It's like when I was walking through the mall in in, in Birmingham a few weeks ago, we walked by a a tobacco store. I don't smoke. But when I walked by, I smelled this strong aroma of pipe tobacco. Again, I don't smoke, but when I smelt that tobacco, my mind was immediately flooded with all these memories of my grandfather because he smoked a pipe tobacco. And immediately all these childhood memories, good memories, flooded my mind. There's one song in particular that when I hear it, immediately I flash back to a 16-year-old teenager in 1983 cruising the parking lots of the mall. Play it. How many of you remember? Come on, let me see your hands. I'm just going to let it play because it brings back some good memories for me. Wait for the part. That one right there. All right, so you can stop it. So when I hear that song, I'm 16 years old again. My dad trusted me enough to drive his sports car. I took the T-tops off. For those of you under 30, that's where the roof comes off. You put it in a leather pouch and you put it in the trunk. And I'm riding around the mall of the parking lot. I've got that song blaring, but I was so cool with my sunglasses on. Everybody was staring at me, but I looked straight ahead like, I know you're looking at me, but I'm not going to look at you. And I'm cruising the parking lot of the mall. Because we remember those good times. Things trigger it. And what I'm here today to tell you is that quit dwelling on your dip. Quit letting where you are rob you of where you could be and what's going on right now. Allow some good memories to flood your mind, to take you back to a time where God did come through. That's what Habakkuk's saying. He's saying, I have good memories, God, of where you came through and where you did some great things, and that's what I'm holding on to. Because I love to go down memory lane with some of my friends. Have you ever been around a friend that you haven't seen in a while? And immediately you start going back over, oh man, do you remember this and do you remember that? And you start laughing. It's good to take some good trips down memory lane. Because there's good memories and there's bad memories. And you got to pick which ones you choose to dwell on. The bad memories will hold you hostage in the dip. But the good memories will remind you of how good it was and how good it can be again, and it'll give you the momentum to scoot right through your dip, right to the highest of heights on the other side. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 3, 
That's what he was doing. He said, I remember when God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Salah. And that means Selah. It means to pause, to reflect upon. Don't rush through it. Stop and savor it. Smell the roses and remember what God did in Taman. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. God was everywhere. So why would he mention Taman? Because the moment that he said to God's people, Taman, they immediately went back to a place where like, God delivered us from Egypt. And not only did he deliver us from Egypt, we were running through the desert. And do you remember that time where the Egyptians were hot on our trail and we were standing at the edge of the Red Sea and Moses held out his staff and the water part and we all ran across on dry land. And when we got to the other side, we turned around and there was the Egyptian. They were coming after us and we were like, oh no, and poof, covered them up and God flooded them and killed them all. Do you remember that? Do you remember when we were trying to escape and all the plagues hit Egypt, but they spared us and we got free? I remember those times. And if God delivered us then, God can deliver us now. You've got to choose to to flood your minds and trigger your mind with those good memories of when God came through in the past. Because when you're in the dip, it's hard to remember. That's why when they crossed through on dry dry land through the Red Sea, God said, grab you 12 12 stones. And I want you to stack them up, one for each tribe of Israel. And I want you to stack them there, stones of remembrance, so that when times get tough, when you go through tough times again, you can come back and you can look at these stones and say, God did it then, he'll do it again now. That's why we take communion every first Sunday of every month. Because when life gets tough and you start feeling like nobody loves you, like nobody cares, you're the only one going through what you're going through, we pull out that communion cup the first Sunday of every month and we remember there was someone who loved me enough to give his life for me. That he died on a cross for me. So this little cup reminds me every month of good memories of a God who loves me, who sent his son, and that there's nothing I can do that would make him love me less. So in verse 4, Habakkuk keeps reminding himself. He said, his splendor is like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. God was so powerful that just a look caused the nations to tremble. And if you grew up in the 80s with parents like I did, it only took a look. How many of you had a mama that would look at you and she'd just look at you and you're just like, oh boy, I better stop. My mama had the look, and she'd look at me. She didn't even have to crack her lips. She'd just look at me and go. And when she did, it was like, ooh, Jesus, I'm more afraid of her than I am of you right now. I know that look. And so the thing is, is that God calls the nations to tremble with just a look. And then here's what Habakkuk does. He goes through verses 7 to 15, and he starts saying, God, I remember. He goes down memory lane. I remember when you led your people through the desert with a a, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. I remember when you fed us manna, bread from heaven. I remember when you parted the Red Sea like we talked about. I remember when we marched around Jericho and the walls fell. I remember when the plagues hit and you delivered us. And God, you could do it then and you could do it now. Renew those deeds in our time. And that's what I pray that the prayer of our church would be right now. God, I remember. I remember when you saved me. I remember when you came through for me back then. And I'm asking you right now to do it again. Because you've got to stop and you've got to remember. I have to remind myself of how many times God came through for me in the past. I've told this story before and I'll tell it again. I'll never forget. I was 16 years old when I gave my heart to Jesus. Like completely, fully to Jesus. I'd been on fire for God at one point in my life. I was on a high. Then I got a girlfriend. The wrong girlfriend. Together we started chasing each other. Lust and sex and other things besides God. And before long, my heart was cold to the things of God. But I was in church every Sunday. I was involved in church but disconnected from God. And maybe that's where you're at today. Oh, you're here. But you're not connected like you used to be to God. I moved from the front all the way to the top of the balcony as far as I could get away from God. And I'll never forget that Sunday sitting in church. 
And the girl that I had dated turned around and looked me in the face and said, I'm pregnant. I panicked. My world was crashing down. I thought my life is over. My parents are going to kill me. What am I going to do? I'm 16 years old. I was in a dip and didn't even know it. And all of a sudden, everything that I thought was worth living for wasn't worth living for anymore. And I said, God, I need your help. And for the record, thank God she was not pregnant. I forgot to tell first service that. I got like a ton of people come up. So there are no little mystery children running around in my, in my past. But from that moment on, God became very real to me. I took a nosedive and a dip, and I started chasing God again. And it was the greatest blessing of my life. It sounds crazy. But I was living for myself. I was living in the world, and my world came crashing down. And when it did, like a scared child, you run to your parent. And I ran back to my father in heaven. And I said, God, I need you. I I strayed away. I don't want to live that life anymore. I remember when my children were young and there wasn't a, bank, a, a dime in our bank account. I didn't know how we were going to put food on the table. I didn't know how we were going to pay our, our rent. And I cried out to God and that next morning I walked into church and someone had, God spoke to the heart of someone and they dropped a thousand dollar check in the offering for me that Sunday. I didn't tell a soul. I remember what God's done over the last 13 years. Church, you think that being a pastor, being a a believer is easy. It's not. The last 13 years, I could chart what the enemy has tried to do and what God has done, and every time he's brought us out of the dip. For those of you that have served God for any amount of time, you could have your own stories of you remember when God came through for you. So what do you do when you're in the dip? You remember what he's done for you in the past. But number two, you accept what he's doing right now. You accept what he's doing right now. You may not like it. It doesn't mean you can't pray for him to change it. But you accept it and you trust him. You don't say, well, it is what it is. I hate that phrase, by the way. Well, it is what it is. You know, in other words, I can't change anything. Yes, you can. You can pray. You can seek God. You can chase after him. You can get out of your dip. But too many Christians just flop down in the middle of their dip and say, well, it is what it is, and if God wants me out, he'll get me out. I'm going to scream till he gets me out. I don't know about you, but I don't go down that easy. Amen? But too many Christians don't want to face the truth. They want to live in denial. They're in a dip. Instead of praying to get out, they just plop down and do nothing. Or they act like what they're in is not real. They decorate their dip and act like it's just a fun place to be, and it's not. Because when you know a storm is coming, you prepare for the storm. And the Word of God tells us a storm is coming. So this series is about preparing you. If you're not in a dip, there will be a time where the enemy will try to drag you in a dip. And when you get in the dip, you've got to remember, I can get out of this. God will come through and God will be faithful. And you pray for that miracle. Verse 16, when God told Habakkuk that the Babylonians were going to be used to destroy him, he freaked out and here's what he said. He said, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound and decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. And you need to feel what he's saying here. When God said, I'm going to use your worst enemy to destroy you. He said, my heart was pounding. My lips were quivering. My legs were shaking because God, that's not what I want. And I realized that what God said was about to happen was going to happen. And it wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't going to be pleasant. And it wasn't going to be a fun season. But I trust God because I remember what he's done in the past and he's not going to desert me now. We've all been through our seasons. We've all been through our dips. It was over 15 years ago. I'll never forget one of the greatest dips I'd been through up to that time. My father-in-law, Kelly's dad, got diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. If there was ever a man of God, he was a man of God. If there was ever a man that could believe for healing, and I believe that would get his healing, it was him. And we prayed and we prayed, and he outlived by years what the doctor said. They gave him months. He lived for years. 
And we thought, for sure, God, if you're going to give him years, when the doctor said month, you're, months, you're going to heal him. He's going to come through this, and we're going to have a testimony, and he's going to declare it. And, and when we start the, our church or do whatever you call us to do, he's going to stand up, and he's going to have a powerful testimony of God's goodness and deliverance and healing. But he died. And I'll never forget standing by his bed, crushed. Because if anybody deserved to be healed, it was him. If anybody had faith to be healed, it was him. And I couldn't understand. And I honestly, I was a pastor and I got angry. And I got mad. I was like, God, why? You could, but you didn't. And I'm ashamed to say it. I was like, there were people during that time that had cancer and they got healed and I was angry. I was mad. Because they weren't good people like my my father-in-law was. They didn't love God like they did. I was making a judgment call that wasn't fair. But I thought, God, why didn't you take them? Because he deserved it. They didn't. That's what I was feeling in my heart. Why didn't you take them, God, and leave him? And God had to deal with my heart and my attitude. Because what do you do when you're in the dip? You remember what he's done. I had to stand there and accept what he did right now, and I didn't like it. But number three, I had to trust what he will do. I had to trust him and remember the past. Accept what he was doing right now, but remember and trust him for the future. And that's found very clearly in verses 17 and 18. Some of the richest of the whole book of verses of the whole book of Habakkuk. He said, I don't understand, God. I don't like it. And the Babylonians should get what's coming to them. You're going to use them to destroy us, but they need to get theirs. And I'm believing that they're going to get theirs. If we get ours, they've got to get theirs. Verse 17, yet I wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. I'm waiting for the Babylonians to get what rightfully they deserve. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will be joyful in God my Savior. You know what he was saying? No matter what I see, I'm going to trust God. I don't see provision. I don't see you coming through right now. I don't see it with my eyes, but I know that you're there. So even though there's no fig trees budding, there's no cattle in the barn, yet will I praise you. Maybe you're a spouse sitting here saying, even though my spouse said till death do us part, they didn't live up to their end of the bargain, and they deserted me, and they left me, and and, and that's not right, God. It's not fair. But yet I will praise you. I'm not going to stop praising you. God, I raised my kids to trust you and to live for you, and they've gone crazy, and I don't know what to do, but yet I will trust you. God, I prayed for somebody to get healed, and they didn't, but I'm going to trust you. My finances are terrible, God, but we trust you. And even though I don't like it, even though I don't understand it, I know you can and I know you could. I don't understand why you have it, but I trust you, God. That's Habakkuk chapter 3 type faith, and that's what I want us to have. That's what faith is. It's not trusting in what I can see. It's trusting that he, who, who he is and what I can't see, I still know that he's working. But you can't have Habakkuk chapter 3 type faith where you come out of that dip till you have chapter one type faith, where you ask the questions, God, I don't understand. God, I don't understand what you're doing, but I trust you. To where you get into chapter two type faith, where you're, you're in the dip and you don't understand what's going on, but you hold on, you don't bail ship. You, you say, God, I don't trust you. I don't like where I'm at. I don't like what you're doing. I know you could, and I know that you have it, but I'm going to hold on because I want to get to chapter three. Because it's in the dip that you cling to God the most. And I heard a pastor friend of mine say this one time, and it was so true. He said, I've walked through enough yesterdays to trust God with my tomorrows. I've walked through enough yesterdays to trust God with every one of my tomorrows. Verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he enables me to go on the heights. He's going to make my footing sure. He's not going to let me slip. He's going to let me climb to higher heights than I've ever been. If you'll hang on in the dip, he'll take you to the higher heights than you've ever been. 
Because do you remember what we said in the first week, in, uh, weeks one and two, what Habakkuk's name meant? It means to embrace and to wrestle. What does a drowning person do when a lifeguard saves them? They grab a hold of him and they fight. They wrestle. Right now, you may be going through something where you're holding on for dear life. You're afraid to let go. But you're wrestling because you don't understand. And what would I tell you? Just don't let go. Don't let go of the one that I know will get you through to the other side. Because he will get you through. He will get you through. Just embrace him and hold on. And that's why he gave us each other. You got to let other people know you're going through the dip so that they can pray for you. So they can be there for you. That's what the church is all about. You can come in, slip in, listen to service and slip out. But church is more than a sermon on a Sunday. It's the people that you can connect with. Because there's a lot of people in their dips right now. And we garner strength from one another when we remember and tell the stories of how he brought us out of our last dip. You will make it through. God's not left you. He's not forsaking you. Just hold on. Bow your heads with me. I'm going to ask you to be very bold. Nobody's looking around, but I want to ask you a question. How many of you would say, Pastor Derek, I relate. I'm in the middle of a dip right now. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you lift your hand with mine? So many hands. You can put them down. Father, I pray right now. In the middle of our dip, when it's hard, when we've got questions, help us to remember your goodness. God, help us to remember what you've done and who you are. Help us to hold on and to not let go. God, help us to lean into our relationships, godly relationships and friendships. God, that we can glean from one another and let's hold on to you and let's not be, get bitter and angry and push you away. But Father, we would hold on to your truth. God, we ask you to renew, do again what you've done in the past. One last question with your head bowed. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You can. Here's the coolest thing I think I've ever heard about God is that He loves us even while we were still sinners. When we were in the heat of our worst moments in life, He still loves us. There's not one thing you could do to make God love you more, and there's not one thing you could do to make Him love you less. So why would you not want to know a God like that? So if you need Jesus to come into your heart, you want God to forgive you of your sins, then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Everybody in the room is going to pray it with you. You don't do it alone. But if you need Christ as your Savior today, I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me and everybody else in the room. So let's pray it together. Dear Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And today I give you my life. I want to thank you for loving me and for saving me. In Jesus' name.